Welcome to our channel. Embark on a journey through our video series dedicated to comprehensively covering the content of the CITB book, Health, Safety and Environment Test for Managers and Professionals. Throughout these videos, we delve into the crucial topics outlined in the book. Section A, Legal and Management. Section B, Occupational Health, Well-being and Welfare. Section C, General Safety. Section D, High Risk Activities. Section E, Environment. Section F, Specialist Activities. In this particular video, we focus on Section B, 05, First Aid and Emergency Procedures. For your convenience, a link in the top right corner of the video allows easy navigation through the entire series. We are certain that by engaging with this video series, you will be thoroughly equipped to effectively handle your CSCS card. Keep in mind, the CSCS test typically lasts around 45 minutes, and scoring at least 45 out of 50 questions correctly is required to pass. Before we delve into the content, please show your support by liking and subscribing. Your support means a lot to us, let's embark on this learning journey together. When displaying notices and signs on site to inform everyone of the first aid arrangements, what needs to be considered? That they are luminous and can be seen in a variety of weather and light conditions. That they are understandable for workers who have language or reading difficulties. That they only placed at the site entrance and in the welfare areas. That they contain the phone number of the local health and safety executive HSE office. When planning an emergency response to an incident involving a casualty, what do all workers on site need to know? How to place the casualty in the recovery position? The location of first aid kits and first aiders. How to submit an online incident report. The location of the nearest ambulance station. What would be the most appropriate way to inform staff and visitors about the location of first aid facilities on site? Make sure they read the site notices. Ask them to speak to the site manager. Make sure they attend the site induction. Ask another site worker to tell them. You have been asked to deliver a site induction to an architect who will visit regularly and a group of students who will visit once. What would be your main consideration? 1. The students will only need to know about the main hazards as they are visiting once and they will be escorted at all times. 2. Both sets of visitors will need to be escorted at all times. Only permanent members of the workforce can have unescorted status. 3. Both sets of visitors will be subject to the same hazards, risks and control measures which means they can attend the same induction. 4. The architect will need a thorough and detailed induction as they will be visiting regularly and will likely need unescorted visitor status. 1 and 2 only. 3 and 4 only. 2 and 3 only. 1 and 4 only. You are delivering a site induction to new workers and are trying to highlight the importance of the site's sign-in and sign-out process. What three explanations would you give to support this? That failure to comply with this requirement may result in disciplinary action being taken against offenders. That the main purpose of this is to make sure that all persons are accounted for in the event of an emergency. That it is a legal security requirement under the Counter-Terrorism and Security Act 2015 and that non-compliance could shut the site down. 
that this is used as a timekeeping tool and inaccurate entries could result in a reduction in pay or non-payment of overtime. That the sign-in and sign-out sheets must be sent to the Health and Safety Executive, HSE, at the end of each month as part of health surveillance monitoring. That anyone unaccounted for in an emergency will be treated as missing and may put emergency workers at risk when looking for someone who isn't there. Regular fire evacuation drills help to inform workers of crucial emergency procedures. Should the drills happen at the same time each week? Yes, this will accurately measure the efficiency of the procedures in place and the effectiveness of the evacuation training. No, drills are not required every week. It is just as effective to discuss the evacuation process with the workers. No, workers can prepare for the drill, which reduces its realism and fails to test workers' knowledge of the evacuation process. Yes, this allows workers to preempt the evacuation and shut down or isolate any machinery that they may be using. Your site has activities that include excavations and working at height. How would you comply with legislation and ensure that new workers involved with these activities were aware of the hazards and emergency procedures? By referring to Schedule 5 of the Construction Design and Management Regulations 2015 and asking them to read the Emergency Procedures document. By referring to Schedule 2 of the Construction, Design and Management Regulations 2015 and distributing a leaflet that contains information on the hazards, locations and emergency procedures. By referring to Schedule 1 of the Construction, Design and Management Regulations 2015 and directing signs detailing hazards and emergency procedures. By referring to Schedule 3 of the Construction, Design and Management Regulations 2015 and developing a site induction that is specific, highlights risks and includes emergency procedures. When should an automated external defibrillator, AED, be used on a person? When they are suffering from severe shock. When they are having a stroke. When they are suffering from heavy bleeding. When they are having a sudden cardiac arrest. Where must eye wash stations and burns kits be located? Only in the areas that might need them. In the site office with the site manager. At the site entrance with the security guard. Where they can be easily accessed by all workers. The potential hazard of flying fragments produced by grinding operations has been identified. Mains tap water is not readily available for eye irrigation. What should be included in the site first aid box? A set of sterile clinical tweezers with rounded magnetic tips and finger stabilising supports. At least one litre of sterile water or sterile normal saline 0.9% in a sealed disposable container. A 500 milliliter can of compressed clinically sterile air in a sealed water-cooled reusable container at least one litre of clinical strength disinfectant or sterile normal saline 2% in a sealed container. Which two factors would determine the need for having an automated external defibrillator AED in the workplace? 
How many of the workforce are or have been regular smokers? How many people may be working in or visiting the workplace? The location of the site in relation to the nearest medical centre. Whether any workers suffer from an asthmatic condition. Whether any work activities could cause amputation of a major limb. Is it good practice to include foil blankets in a site's first aid kit? Yes, foil blankets should only be included during the winter months when it is wet and cold to prevent a casualty developing hypothermia. No, foil blankets are bulky and take up too much room in a first aid kit, which means that essential items will need to be left out. Yes, foil blankets help to retain body heat and they can be used in winter to keep a casualty warm or in summer if a casualty has gone into shock. No, if you have developed an effective emergency procedure plan and you have appropriate first aid facilities, then foil blankets are not needed. What should be the main consideration when placing first aid equipment around site? It is located in the main site office at all times. It is located in the first aid room equipment cabinet. It is located in a place where it is likely to be needed. It is located with the first aider at all times. Which of the following are key features of an automated external defibrillator AED? 1. They are capable of interpreting a casualty's heart rhythm and delivering an electric shock with minimal input from the operator. 2. They are capable of providing effective cardiopulmonary resuscitation CPR, which will keep a casualty stable until medical assistance arrives. 3. They are the only device that can prevent death from a heart attack and have a high success rate for casualty recovery in the UK. 4. They are programmed not to deliver a shock to a casualty unless detecting the presence of a heart rhythm that requires defibrillation. 1 and 2 only. 3 and 4 only. 1 and 4 only. 2 and 3 only. Which one of the following is a main responsibility of an appointed person? Carry out first aid duties if a qualified first aider is not present. Assist the qualified first aider with triage and monitor all unconscious casualties. Contact the emergency services and direct them to the scene of the accident. Apply plasters, dressings and slings to minor wounds and burns. A first aider can assist an individual to take their prescribed injectable medicine, but they must never administer it themselves. Are there any exceptions to this rule? Yes, a first aider can inject any medicine as it is a skill covered on the first aid course, but they must gain consent from the casualty first. No, a first aider would be charged with grievous bodily harm, GBH, if they were to inject any medicine into a casualty. Yes, a first aider can administer injected adrenaline, such as an EpiPen, for the purpose of saving the life of a casualty. No, a first aider must never inject any medicine. They should call 999, make the casualty comfortable and wait for professional help. Which one of the following would be the most suitable to help you identify your first aid requirements? 
British Red Cross First Aid at Work Manual First Aid Approved Code of Practice, ACOP Health and Safety First Aid Regulations, 1981 The Workplace Health, Safety and Welfare Regulations, 1992 Which two of the following factors must be considered when providing first aid facilities on site? The cost of training staff to become qualified first aiders. The hazards, risks and nature of the work being carried out. The health, fitness and medical history of all staff and visitors. The space in the site office to store the necessary equipment. The maximum number of people expected to be on site at any time. Although a first aid certificate is valid for three years, the Health and Safety Executive, HSE, recommends that first aiders undergo annual refresher training. What is the main reason for this? to assess whether an employer has a proactive approach to the health, safety and well-being of staff. To provide evidence of continual training which will help to prevent a prosecution after an incident. To give employers an opportunity to reduce accidents at work and lower their insurance premiums. To help qualified people maintain their skills and keep up to date with changes to first aid procedures. You are conducting a first aid needs assessment on your site, which has 110 workers. How many first aid at work, FAW, trained staff would you need to comply with the Health and Safety First Aid Regulations, 1981? 2. One FAW for every 60 workers. 3. One FAW for every 50 workers. 4. One FAW for every 30 workers. 5. One FAW for every 25 workers. Following a first aid needs assessment, which of the following additional training is likely to be relevant on all types of construction sites? 1. Application of hemostatic dressings and or tourniquets. 2. Management of a casualty suffering from hydrofluoric acid burns. 3. Management of a casualty suffering from cyanide poisoning. 4. Management of a casualty suffering from hypothermia or hyperthermia. 1 and 2 only. 3 and 4 only. 2 and 3 only, 1 and 4 only. Although the assessment of first aid does not need to be formally recorded, why is it considered good practice to do so? If an accident occurs, employers can use their written documents as evidence during legal proceedings which will prevent them from receiving a fine or custodial sentence. The information will help the first aiders on site to choose the contents for the first aid boxes and to identify and purchase any specialised medical equipment. Employers can demonstrate to a safety representative, the Health and Safety Executive, HSE, or local authority inspector, how they decided on their level of first aid provision. Employers can print the findings of the first aid needs assessment and distribute them to visitors or new workers during the site health and safety induction. Which three of the following factors should be considered in a first aid needs assessment? The skills, knowledge and experience of the workers. The type of work or operations being carried out. Whether there are special or unusual hazards. 
the minimum number of people that will be on site. The fitness and agility levels of the workers. The remoteness of emergency medical services. You are responsible for providing first aid on site, including a first aid room. A manager asks you if they can store some electrical equipment in there as it is rarely used and is a waste of valuable space. Would you agree to this request? No, the signals from the electrical equipment could interfere with specialist first aid kit. Yes, so long as the equipment was stored neatly in a corner and was always kept clean. No, the first aid room should be available at all times and used only for administering first aid. Yes, as long as access to the room is not restricted and equipment is stored neatly under the treatment bed. Which of the following other than required first aid materials can sites also provide to ensure a satisfactory first aid room setup? 1. A sink with hot and cold running water. 2. A resuscitation training mannequin. 3. A reclining chair that offers back support. 4. Drinking water with disposable cups. 1 and 3 only. 2 and 4 only. 3 and 2 only. 1 and 4 only. First aid provision must be adequate and appropriate in the circumstances. What should you do to meet this requirement? Provide a qualified first aider for every 25 members of staff and regularly review the contents of the first aid needs assessment. Instruct a qualified first aider and an appointed person to identify the provision that is needed for the site and specific work areas. Conduct a first aid needs assessment and communicate the contents of the assessment to all site workers and the nearest hospital. Ensure that sufficient first aid equipment, facilities and personnel are available at all times, taking account of alternative working patterns. When conducting a first aid needs assessment on site, which one of the following would not need to be given as much consideration regarding the first aid arrangements? If the build sections are spread out across buildings and floors. If members of the public are regularly visiting the site. If self-employed workers under the control of an employer are on site. If inexperienced workers or employees with disabilities are working on site. You are observing a first aider conducting an emergency response simulation, mock-up exercise, which involves an unconscious worker lying on the floor next to an electrical cable. What is the first thing that the first aider should do? Locate a wooden pole or stick and move the cable away from the casualty. Assess the situation and identify any danger to themselves or others. Move the worker away from the cable and out of immediate danger. Tell the appointed person to get the automated external defibrillator, AED. Congratulations on your progress. Every step brings you closer to your goals. Keep embracing knowledge until you achieve your desired success. Look for the link in the top right corner to seamlessly transition to the next video.